Good morning, everybody. If you want to go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, that's where we'll spend our time together. I want to welcome everybody here this morning. It's good to see everyone. We have several visitors with us. Uh, I know I've had an opportunity to meet a few of you, and we're incredibly grateful for your presence. Uh, and if you have time, I know your schedule might be busy, but if you're able to stay around for just a few minutes after services, we'd love to get to know you better. I have no idea how that made it into my slides. <laughs> wow. So for those that don't know, Susan and I welcomed our first grandbaby into the world. And uh, one of the perks of being a preacher is I get to control the slides for my sermon. <laughs> so you are stuck looking at my first grandparent picture this morning. Um, so Parker Grace was born at 8.30 last night. And uh, I joked I was going to work a picture in this morning, and I did. All right. I, I know we've got a lot going on as a church family. I mean, there's things to be thankful and exciting for just like that. But I know there are other folks that are hurting this morning and just some difficulties that maybe some people are experiencing. So uh, before we get started in the lesson, let's go to God in prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you, that we can pray to you, God, that we can bring to you the things that we are thankful for, Father, that we are uh, excited about and uh, father we are grateful to you for the way that you bless our lives there are also times though god where either individually in our own lives or father people that we love and care about go through things that are painful uh, that might be difficult for us to watch and god we know that even this morning as we gather here there are those in our family that are hurting or suffering in some way father even those that are here present physically with us uh, can still be going through difficulty. God, we pray that uh, as a church family that this will be a place of comfort and peace. But Father, most of all, we pray that we will find in you and in your Son the true healing and peace that we need so desperately in our lives. And God, we pray that you would be with us now as we think about kingdom living and Jesus and his challenging message to us. And Father, help us to think uh, more deeply on him and on the cross and more importantly, Father, help him to transform our lives every day. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. I know some of you in this room have uh, served in the military. And it's always kind of fun and this friendly banter to kind of go back and forth around which branch of the military might be the best or maybe some of the perks to one branch over another branch. Uh, I served uh, active duty enlisted in the Air Force, and then I served in the Army Reserve, so I got a taste of at least two branches. But I've always kind of been a little bit intrigued, and for me personally at least, and I know some of you are going to roll your eyes when I say this, there's always just something a little bit different about the Marines. Um, their physical training and what they go through, they go through a longer boot camp than most of the other branches. And even if you look just in general at their advertising, there's just kind of something a little different. Uh, about their advertising. I remember one of the advertisements they used to have was a man that was standing on the edge of a diving platform looking down at a, at a pool of water. And he was talking about how he didn't know how to swim and he was scared to death to jump off of that platform. He said, but I jumped. And he said, I came up. And when I came up, I was a Marine. And, you know, there's just this sense of pride about it. I don't know how that works. That's a fancy pool, I guess. But anyway, um, there, we all know their taglines, right? Many are called, but only a few will earn the title of United States Marine, or the few, the proud, the Marines. And the premise behind their advertising is, is basically this. Look, this is not for everybody. It's challenging. It's difficult. There's nothing easy about it. But there's a reward for those that are able to complete it. This morning, I want you to think about Jesus and his invitation to kingdom living with me. And as we kind of finish up this study, I want us to think about the result of kingdom living because I believe in some ways Jesus issues a challenge in, that basically says, look, this isn't easy. It's not even necessarily for everybody, but there are incredible rewards that go along with it. We've been studying Matthew chapter 5 over the past couple of months, and we've been looking at the Beatitudes, and we've talked about the incredible transformation that takes place in the life of an individual that will allow Jesus to come in and rule in his or her life, ultimately submitting to what Jesus calls kingdom living. We talked about the poor in spirit, recognizing our own sinful need for God and for the cross, the ability to mourn, 
that that sin in our own lives should drive us to our knees in tearful sorrow to God. The need for being meek in how we view ourselves, but more importantly, how we treat other people. The need to hunger and thirst for righteousness, for God's standard of living. The need to be merciful, pure in heart, peacemakers. But I want you to notice how Jesus is going to end this section. We're going to look at verse 10 of Matthew chapter 5. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. There's a subtle shift that occurs in verse 11, and I don't want us to miss it, because as Jesus has been preaching this incredible sermon on the side of a mountain, and He's inviting His listeners to participate in this kingdom living, He's kind of spoke in broad terms as He began this discussion. He talks about, blessed are those. And He speaks in kind of this broad nature. And even in verse 10, blessed are those who are persecuted. But notice what happens in verse 11. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you. Verses 10 and 11 are combined. They're joined together. And I can't help but wonder, maybe in part, if Jesus in verse 10 is still talking to the multitude of disciples that are there listening to Him preach on the side of this mountain, but maybe, just maybe, and this is speculation on my part, as He goes to verse number 11, He maybe turns to His apostles. Because you see, they're going to experience something even a little bit more difficult. And now he gets a little bit more personal in their lives. Blessed are you when people persecute you and insult you. This morning as we think about the results of kingdom living, I want us to consider some things that kingdom living involves, not only to the audience that Jesus preached this sermon to, but more importantly even to you and me as we think about our own lives. And what is the impact of this message that Jesus spoke some 2,000 years ago going to have on you and me this morning? The first thing I want us to notice is this. Kingdom living involves a difficult reality. I love the transparency of Jesus, not just here, but throughout His ministry. I think about my own life, and, and maybe as I try to share something that's important to me with other people, my tendency is this. I want to focus on the positive aspects of it. Whatever I want to share that I think is good for somebody, I'm going to focus on the benefits of it, even if there are some difficulties associated with it. And I might maybe kind of work in some of the difficulties, but I'm certainly not going to put them out there first and foremost so that somebody kind of dwells on what the difficult part might be. But Jesus is always transparent when it comes to following Him. He's always going to talk about the benefits He's always going to talk about the great need, but He's never going to downplay the difficulty that comes along in following Him. I want you to think about just a couple of examples. You can leave a marker here in Matthew chapter 5 and turn to Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, we find some interesting things that happens within this chapter. And in verse 10, one of the most fascinating is Jesus feeding the 5,000. Here's an incredible miracle that provides for the needs of people that are there in order to hear Jesus speak. And then in verse number 18, we read about Peter and his confession about Jesus. And then in verse number 21, we see this incredibly difficult moment as Jesus would predict his death. So all of these things are going on in the lives of the apostles and in the lives of the disciples and those that have been listening to Jesus. But notice what he says in verse number 23. And he said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed. When he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. 
Again, we see Jesus' transparency as He's inviting people to follow Him. Jesus wants everyone to follow Him, but He wants to be transparent about what He's asking of people. And one of the most difficult things for people when it comes to following Jesus is understanding that it is going to call for the greatest acts of self-denial that anyone could ever imagine. Not just then. You see, when Jesus spoke these words, there was a very harsh reality to the phrase, pick up your cross daily and follow me. You see, we are 2,000 years removed from Roman culture. None of us in this room have ever witnessed a crucifixion. In fact, for most of us, the cross may even be a piece of jewelry or something that is maybe hanging in our homes. It's something that we think about intellectually. It's something maybe that we understand spiritually, but none of us will ever be faced with the reality of a death on a Roman cross. But that was very much a reality to the apostles and to Jesus' audience. So when He said these words, they weren't just some form of hyperbole or poetic language that was challenging them to think about what they were going to have to give up. It was truly a message of, you've got to deny yourself even to the point of death. But yet Jesus spoke as someone who had experienced that Himself. So it calls for the greatest acts of self-denial. But once again, Jesus puts it in the proper context because He talks about the value of a person's life. Is that a high price to pay for discipleship? Absolutely. That's not to be taken lightly. It's not anything that's not thought about completely and thoroughly. It comes at a high price, but the value that is gained is worth it. Jesus says, how do you put a price on your life? Because you see, Jesus was always about getting people to see the reality of their life instead of just the surroundings that they found themselves in at any given moment. But I think only, not only about Luke chapter 9, but also John chapter 6. Turn with me there. I find John chapter 6, at least for me, to be one of the more challenging chapters in all of the Gospels. In many ways, we find Jesus at the pinnacle of His ministry. The chapter opens again with feeding of the 5,000. And Jesus has this clamoring of people that are following Him. He sends His disciples away and Jesus goes away. And all these people that have just received this tremendous blessing go searching after Him. And they find Him. And Jesus now, with maybe the largest following He's ever had in His ministry, has an opportunity around what is He going to say next? What's going to be the next message? And what we find is Jesus actually elevates the teaching because, you see, Jesus, being deity, knows the hearts of the people. And so Jesus knows that now there are those that are starting to follow Him for what they can physically get out of it. And so He's trying to challenge them to think more about their lives than just the physical. And He teaches some difficult words. Even today, if we were to go through and study this chapter and read his comments about eating his flesh and drinking his blood, there's still people in the religious world that struggle. These aren't easy words to understand. And without going too deep, the basic message that Jesus is trying to get across to his audience is, if you really want life, you've got to believe in me. You've got to believe in all of me. You've got to accept every aspect of me and of my teaching and of what I'm trying to offer you. And notice what happens in verse number 60. After all that Jesus has spoken and said, we read these words. When many of His disciples heard it, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in Himself that His disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, Do you take offense at this? You see, you're left with an audience that Jesus has tried to elevate and He's challenged them with His teaching and they're just struggling understanding it because, you see, they didn't necessarily come there originally seeking this spiritual message. They came wanting another meal. And Jesus says, I'm going to feed you, but I want to feed you what you really need. And so this incredible audience, literally these thousands of people that Jesus is speaking to, at perhaps the greatest point at least in terms of audience following in his ministry, is struggling with the message. And here's ultimately what happens in verse 66. And after this, many of his disciples turned back 
and no longer walked with him. Here's what I find fascinating. If it was me, I got to be honest. I would have gone after him. I, I think I would have done something to at least say, hey, wait a minute. Hey, let me try this again. Let me, let me maybe have a second shot to get across this message to you. Maybe I can put it in a way that will help you understand it. But it's interesting. Jesus lets them go. And in verse 67, Jesus said to the twelve, Do you want to go away as well? He turns to those that He had called. Because you see, they, they still had a choice. And I have to believe they were struggling in many ways as the audience. But Peter's answer is one that's so important. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You see, Jesus was transparent in what he was asking of people. And he was transparent in that what I'm asking isn't easy to the point sometimes there were those that even walked away because they couldn't accept what he was teaching. But Peter says one of the most fundamental things, maybe one of the most fundamental lessons that we can learn when it comes to kingdom living we may not understand everything. There may be times as we study Jesus and His life that we struggle with some of the things He's asking of us. We may even struggle with the message. We may not understand it all. But we at least have to understand what Peter understood. I may not get it all, but where else am I going to go? Where else am I going to go to get the words of life that I really need? Hey, the food was great. It satisfied a physical need. But the ultimate food that takes care of what I need to restore my relationship with God, there's no place else I can go. And even in Matthew chapter 5, as Jesus is inviting His audience to this kingdom living, to allowing Him to rule in their lives, to challenge them to think about the transformation that is needed, He's honest with them about a, a truth of kingdom living, a difficulty associated with it, it's not going to be easy. It's going to involve persecution, the idea of being harassed for what you believe. But if we go back to Matthew chapter 5, we find that this persecution comes because of their righteousness. You see, it's really not persecution to be punished for doing evil or to suffer for doing evil. That's just punishment. But when a person suffers for following God and trying to live by His standards and trying to be an image bearer of God, then that's persecution. And it can come physically. It can come emotionally. It can come verbally. There can be all different kinds of different ways that a person can suffer. But Jesus tells this audience, and He gets specific with the apostles, and it's as if He's looking at you and me this morning Repeating those words, blessed are you when you suffer because of your beliefs in God. But it's not just believing it. I think about Warren's class this morning, the adult class here in the auditorium as we talked about faith. A difficult topic, you see. It's not just believing in something, it's living it out. And that's what kingdom living is all about. It's living it out on a day-to-day -day basis. And Jesus warns His audience, He's being transparent with them, that as you do that, it's not going to be an easy life. There are going to be difficulties that go along with it. But we also need to understand that kingdom living involves a thoughtful choice. You see, Jesus, just as we witnessed in Matthew chapter 6, is not looking for some haphazard response. He's not looking for a knee-jerk response. Let's go back to Luke chapter 9. As Luke would close out this chapter, beginning in verse 57. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, No one puts his hand to the plow and looks back 
is fit for the kingdom of God. Man, here's another just difficult passage. It, it challenges us really to our core to think about the fact that here are individuals that are saying, hey, I want to follow, but Jesus, as only He can do as deity, understands that maybe there's just a half-hearted commitment. And so he tries to, to illustrate a point by challenging his audience to think about the choice that they are wanting to make. I'm not just looking for half-hearted commitment. You've got to understand that when you choose to follow me, when you choose to come after me, that it comes at a cost. But understand fully that the choice is yours. Jesus never stiff arms anyone into following him. He doesn't use guilt. He doesn't try to manipulate. Jesus always honestly comes to the very heart of who we are. And He comes to our greatest need. And He says, look, I have the answer to your greatest need. I am that answer. The void that's in your life, I can fill it. The life that you desperately need, I am it. And He lays out all that He has to offer. But then He leaves that choice at the feet of those that hear. But what He does ask is count the cost. Because you see, Jesus says... The challenge is no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. Because you see, if we choose to go after him and then turn and leave and go back, there are consequences. Not only for us individually, but there are consequences for how others might look and see Jesus. Or how others might look and see the kingdom and others that are trying to participate. And, and it can do damage, not only to ourselves, but to other people. Turn a few more pages in Luke to Luke chapter 14. Look at verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he's laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet those who come against him with 20,000? And if not, while the others yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore... Any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Again, we see this difficult reality that what Jesus asked for is he asked for all of us. But again, he doesn't just ask that of us. He, he wants us to consider what he's asking, what he's offering, what we have to give up. He's asking his audience, take everything into account that I'm asking of you. Don't make a rash decision. Don't make a snap judgment. Because you see, what I'm asking for is wholehearted commitment in every way. I think maybe one of the greatest tools that Satan tries to use against us is feeling like we can be half in Christ and half in our own lives, however we want to be. And it's hard because sometimes when we find ourselves in that position, we find ourselves in a situation where we feel like I'm enough in Christ to feel like I'm okay, but yet there's still something in my life that I'm holding on to that I just don't want to give up for Christ. It's hard to let go of ourselves. That's not easy. Jesus says, I want the deepest part of you. I want the part that's the hardest for you to let go of. I want you to let go of all of it. I want you to give it to me. Why does he have the right to do that? Why? I think there are two fundamental answers. We think about what Jesus is asking, even in Matthew chapter 5, as he, he challenges his audience to think about kingdom living, because listen, if you choose this path in life, then know that part of your path will include persecution. It's going to include insults. Did Jesus' life include those things? Last Sunday, we looked at the cross. 
And we looked at, at Jesus and what he went through and some of the crowd that was there at that cross. Jesus went through insults, didn't he? Literally, while his body was hanging on that cross, covered in blood, as he struggled to even breathe, people were insulting him with their words. He certainly suffered persecution physically. He was flogged to the point that his back was nothing more than an open piece of flesh, of raw flesh. So when Jesus talks about persecution and he talks about insults, he was rejected by his own family. He knows. He understands what he's inviting people to, but on the same side, he understands how to comfort and how to encourage and how to help people through that process. Does Jesus understand what it's like to let go of something that you hold dearly? I think about Philippians chapter 2. As Paul would talk about the fact that Jesus was equal with God, but yet he let it go in order to humble himself as the form of a servant. He let go of equality with God, existence in the very place that you and I long for, that we're striving to get to, in order to come be a servant and live here on this earth. So when Jesus asks you and me to let go of whatever it is we hold dear, He understands what that means. And He knows how to help us through the difficulty of that process. But you see, as Jesus invites His audience into kingdom living, He invites the audience in a way so that we all understand this is a choice. It's a choice that we make. It's a choice that they made some 2,000 years ago. But as Jesus does this, there's also something that needs to be understood. Not only is there a difficult reality, not only is there a choice to be made, but there's also this beautiful reality that Jesus paints for His audience. Let's go back and conclude in Matthew chapter 5. And we'll maybe do this in reverse order, but I want to start in verse 11. Basically, Jesus says this, You're going to suffer, it's not going to be easy, but you're in good company. He says, Rejoice and be glad, verse 12, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You think about the prophets of the Old Testament. They were God's spokespeople. They were His spokesperson to the people. That's what they did. And most of the time, they came on the scene at some very difficult times in the history of God's people. And and here, Jesus kind of lumps them all together. He puts all the prophets together, but maybe the one that was persecuted the most, that we think about the most, is Jeremiah. You think about Jeremiah. He was called by God even against his own protesting. He didn't want to go. He was mocked and ridiculed by his own villagers where he lived. He was beaten and put in stocks by the priest. He barely escaped death from an angry mob. He was thrown into a well, ultimately put into slavery and wound up in Egypt. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Like another story. He suffered greatly in his life. But as I think about these words that Jesus spoke, it's hard not to think about Hebrews chapter 12. And you think about Hebrews chapter 12 and what precedes it, chapter 11, this incredible hall of fame. And the very closing part of that chapter, again, we talked about it last Sunday, references without naming individuals, Some of these great heroes, some of whom alluded to there are the prophets. And in chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we read these words. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. You see, here's the great thing. Not only does Jesus say, look, you're in good company, but the Hebrews writer would go on to say, that company that we're in, it's as if they are looking down upon us in the stands. And they are looking at us as we try to live our life of faith. And as we are maybe struggling and suffering some form of persecution, they are there looking down on us, cheering us on and encouraging us. Don't give up. It's possible. 
You can be faithful. You can keep on. You can do this. And they are our cloud of witnesses, along with countless others that have gone before us, that are encouraging us. And as they encourage us, what they're trying to do is shift our eyes away from whatever problems we might find back to Jesus and the cross. Because you see, He's always the ultimate example, isn't He? In everything that we try to do, in every way that we try to live, He's the ultimate example of how to persevere through persecution. And even though He knows that this is a part of kingdom living, He's given us every tool that we need, including this incredible form of encouragement that comes from the examples of people that have been faithful in doing the very thing that you and I are trying to do as we gather here this morning. But then ultimately, the ultimate reward, Jesus says, going back to verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This very kingdom living that Jesus is inviting us into. He says, look, if you're able to allow me to transform your life and you're faithful and you endure whatever struggles come your way, this kingdom belongs to you and you are a part of it. And you have the ability to experience it now, but even in more greater detail, verse 12, because your reward is great in heaven. One of those prophets in the Old Testament, Daniel, chapter 2 and verse 44, would prophesy about something incredibly important about this kingdom. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms and bring them to an end, and it shall stand forever. Daniel's prophesying about how all these world powers that had existed, that were going to exist into the future, they're all going to end. But this incredible kingdom that God is going to establish, it's never going to end. It's indestructible. And man, that was tough for the audience that Jesus spoke to because what those Jews longed for was they longed for an earthly kingdom. They didn't want to be persecuted by pagan nations anymore. They didn't want to be ruled by what they considered to be pagan nations. And they wanted nothing more than for God to restore them as an earthly kingdom. And Jesus is initiating or ushering in this kingdom of God. And it's coming in a way that they didn't anticipate. But it is going to be more powerful than anything they could have ever imagined. And you see, they had the ability to be a part of it then... And you and I have an ability to be part of it now. And we get the blessings now, but yet there's still more that we have to look forward to. But there's a reality associated with that kingdom living. And that reality requires us to be transformed by Jesus, the very heart of these beatitudes that Jesus spoke in verses 3 through 9. But it also comes with the understanding that Jesus wants all of us, and as we submit all of our lives to Him, it's not necessarily going to be an easy road. It's going to come with difficulties, but it's going to have some tremendous blessings that go along with it. And I guess the great thing for you and me this morning is this. We sit here this morning, and it it is as if Jesus is still on the side of that mountain, And what He is asking of us is the same thing He was asking of them that day. He is inviting us into kingdom living with Him. He's inviting us into the blessings associated with it. He's inviting us into the sufferings that He suffered. But what He's saying is, trust me. Trust me through this process. I will give you everything you need to be successful. And if you will just trust me, the rewards will be worth it all. But you see, that's the challenge sometimes, isn't it? It's trusting. It's letting go of the control that we desire and giving that control to Him and letting go of even those parts of our lives that maybe we secretly want to hold on to and giving it over to Him regardless of what it means for us now. And so we think about Jesus' invitation to kingdom living. And we can't think about that invitation without looking at the cross. Because you see, that's the price He paid in order for us to participate in that kingdom with Him. So this morning, I would 
ask you just to look to the cross and evaluate your life in light of the cross this morning. And we are always here as a, a family of God's people. And one of our primary purposes for being here is to encourage each other. To encourage each other to don't quit. Don't give up. If you're going through a season of difficulty in your walk of faith, don't quit. Lean on us as a family. And if there's anything we can do to encourage you, to pray with you, just to tell you, don't stop. We want to do that this morning. And if you want to know more about Jesus, we'd love to share him with you. If we can help you in any way, just let us know now as together we stand and sing.